Hi folks, I'm Ryan Birchall. I'm a platform subject matter expert with ThoughtWorks. And I'm Ryan Murray. I'm the director of our digital platform strategy group. And I really want to give a huge shout out to the team at Sonic, the leaders there, and all of the developers and engineers and QAs that started work on that. That has been an amazing story for, of platform building that our team started two years ago. So congratulations to all the work they did. Thank you. So today we're going to talk quickly about cross-functional teams and how we're moving beyond. Cross-functional teams are great for enhancing communication and shipping stuff fast. Most organizations have problems today that are far bigger than a team. And so we want to talk a little bit about platform thinking and platform architecture and how that can take us to the next level. All right. So I want to challenge things. I always like to kind of start off with a little bit of uh, thinking around what anti-patterns, things people may have seen, challenge some basic notions of things. So. My first favorite one is talking about, you know, building DevOps teams everywhere. We see this, right? We're going to do DevOps and we're going to make sure that ever there's operations on every development team. But would you really ask yourself, you know, before you start moving things to the cloud, hey, AWS, I'm going to need some of those AWS ops people on every one of my development teams. You would never say that. So the question I would ask you is why would you say that of your own ops leadership, right? Just something to think about. Or the other, we're going to have DevSecOps that's going to fix everything, except when we start doing massive scale, I don't have enough sec for the SecOps, right? They're hard to find, and they don't really spread around really well. Or the other cross-functional uh, anti-pattern we see, we've got a legacy system we've got to work with. We're going to grab somebody from that legacy team. We're going to have a person in our team. They can run all that back to our conversation for us. They can make sure that they get all of that done, and they'll, that will just simply eliminate all the friction. So I want to make sure we acknowledge there's been a lot of great things that have happened over the last nine years in the realm of DevOps and thinking about the real things that count as DevOps, flow, feedback, automation, teams working together, communication, all of that is really valid. But there's a lot going on in the marketplace right now that messes with that message. And it confuses people about what this, all these messages really mean and how to organize cross-functional teams. And it's getting harder and harder to understand what really works and to figure out how to measure it. And so before we start talking about what we should do to change, I think it's really important to know if we're doing it right. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is some of the work and some of the ways we're measuring success. Just want to point out that there's a great book out there by Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble, Gene Kim. It's called Accelerate. They've taken the last five years of the DevOps report, 27,000 different companies have contributed to this, and they've done the data analysis, the statistics, to help us understand what differentiates high, medium, and low-performing companies, both from a software release perspective and from a commercial perspective perspective. And there's a couple of outputs of that book. There's way too much to talk about here, but there's a couple of things that we think are important and that lead into the rest of this discussion. And so the first thing is, what turns out to be the four key metrics? What helped them? What did they prove clusters those different companies into those groups? And the first one of those is develop deployment frequency. Can your teams deploy when the business wants them to deploy? And how often a year do they deploy, right? High performers are deploying at least once a day. Lead time for changes. How long from when I commit my code do I see my code in a place that it can be reviewed by the business or released by the business? Again, high performers are in less than an hour. Mean time to recovery. If I try a business experiment, release a new feature, or something goes wrong operationally, how long does it take me to bring that back? And then change failure rate. How often are my changes actually failing, right? These four metrics have been shown to be able to really measure any company that's been involved in that survey and understand their commercial results. But what's interesting is there's a couple of key takeaways that lead into what we want to talk about. One of them is it turns out that tech stack doesn't matter, right? So are you working in a mainframe? It turns out that doesn't actually correlate with success. It has no correlation between being in high, middle, or low. Got a Greenfield, cool Kubernetes project with all the coolest open source, doing all the cool little toys, playing with all the right things. Doesn't correlate either, has no correlation. So what does matter? Turns out architecture matters, right? What can your team do? Can they change and deploy when they want to? Can they test? Can they deploy the system? And most importantly, can they do it without any friction? Can they do it using self-service capabilities that are built within the system? And do they have to communicate with any teams or communicate with no teams in order to deploy? So it turns out that out of all those findings, the thing that's key to what we want to talk about today is how architecture matters. I think platform plays a large part in that architectural story. So for that piece, I'll hand it over to Ryan. Thank you, sir. So how do we accomplish this at scale? What we were talking about effectively as we look at kind of platform architecture is that these DevOps metrics, they don't just, they're often people interpret them at the level of a single team, a single code base, right? How fast can I ship? But in reality, these are measured also at the organizational level. How can I ship capability is definitely dictated by more than one team in any non-trivial organization. And so what we know, digital companies, we're always looking to create 
better systems, better experiences that meet our users' goals and meet those journeys. And obviously, as software layers, we have touch points that we're going through, web, mobile, you know, Alexa these days. But all of it's about the experience that we can deliver. So we, how do we ship experiences faster? And the key here, to going beyond that concept of cross-functionality is, well, we want to create other software layers that contain business capabilities that are available as APIs and events to be able to speed those teams that are innovating on experience. And what's a business capability? Could be calculating a credit risk score. It could be helping to create orders in an order system. It could be onboarding a customer. But those are things that our business needs to do in a consistent way. And an experienced team that's thinking about a broader journey shouldn't need to think about. Similarly, we've heard a lot of great talks today uh, from Theo and others about, from an infrastructure perspective, all of the teams that are building software at all these layers, right? We've got mobile app code that we heard about today. We've got those ex that experience level code. Now we've got core capabilities that are going in as microservices. All of those things get enabled by a great infrastructure platform. And so the real question is, how do we enable technology teams to deliver faster across this entire spectrum? So how many out here work at either a large enterprise or perhaps a mature started up? OK, so at least half of the room, fantastic. So I'm sure you've seen an architecture diagram that's 10 times worse than this one, right? Everything point to point connected. Well, let's say we're trying to build a new call center application. That's my blue line. I want that team that's going to build a call center application, that's an experience. I'm trying to help my call center agents to be able to react more to the customer's needs on the fly. But in the back end, I've got three different instances of my ERP solution. Each one has different data formats, and people use fields in different ways, probably different business rules. So a cross-functional team building that call center solution might say, as Roundbird pointed out, get that expert from the, you know, from the ERP in here. Well, wait, get three experts from the ERP, because they're all different, right? But if they do that, you know, then that team is able to solve that problem of, how do I deal with creating orders or managing customers across these things? But who else benefits from that? The next team that's trying to build maybe a web interface to allow customers to directly manage their orders, they go through the same exercise of trying to figure out all those problems, and they probably don't come to the same answers. So what we like to talk about is when we're thinking about how to accelerate and we want to build that platform architecture, how do we focus on encapsulating correctness with the capabilities that we built, right? So we want to think about things like business rules, business processes, validation logic. Where are these things today in your complex enterprise? And how do we start to unite them into single capabilities behind a single API that allows people to consume them? Therefore, I get that advantage now as I build new experiences that need those same capabilities. Everything is working properly, and I'm not having different sort of business problems across the enterprise. Similarly, operational excellence. Here's infrastructure makes this very simple to understand, right? Google, when it built Borg famously, they realized they were just scaling too fast to keep up. They couldn't find enough systems engineers with the skills they needed. They had to find a technology solution. And a lot of our infrastructure at AWS and other cloud providers gives us incredible operational excellence as a service. And lastly, you know, I'd throw out security. That's a very important type of correctness, obviously. Now, we know that we want teams to be very security aware, and we're not saying not to do that. But what security can you bake in to the infrastructure and bake in to the capabilities, like we heard Karthik talking about in terms of microservices, to just systemically take risk off the table? This, for us, is the idea of platform thinking. How do we think organizationally? So this is, again, beyond the scope of a team. And we're in the Crocs functional team land. There's a risk, and we see this all the time with our clients, that we either miss a lot of these things, we don't have the right skills necessarily in the room, or we duplicate effort frequently, not getting the same results. So we like to think about this as you know, Unix philosophy, do one thing, do it well, or being dry, don't repeat yourself, but do this at an organizational level. And think about how we build team boundaries to encapsulate that correctness. It's not enough just to build software that encapsulate correctness. If you're still working in organizations that fund projects, which are kind of features or journeys, you'll probably notice that software often gets pretty beat up by teams that are driving through. It's essential that we also organize for this. Because in the end, we're really trying to enable what we might call vertical scale, right? In the end, you know, distributed systems world, vertical scale is a, bit, a dirty word, I know. But Platform architecture really is about creating vertical scale in terms of how we deliver. So we want to make sure that our teams are focusing on doing one thing well, getting at the bottom of a stack. We have, for example, coarse grain inventory service. Then we have maybe a find in store service built on top of the inventory service. And then if I decide I want to do a reserve in store or click and collect, I could build that on top of find in store. Each unit of that work, if it's done well, exposed as an API, 
means that that team who's building that next level up doesn't have to think about that. They get it for free. And so again, really talking about people as well. How do I create vertical scale in my organization to that Google point, right? I don't have enough expertise and knowledge of my systems, backend systems typically to go around. So platform thinking, platform architecture is the way that we solve that. Now, when we do this, we often have to think about, I have to remodel my legacy, right? I, if, I, if I woke up in this world, then clearly I could just go ahead and democratize my architectural tangle with my APA platform. But, and, and a lot of our customers do that. They, they create mandates that say, okay, everything has to be an API now, and teams go and they build APIs. And they build APIs that reflect the current mess. And so what we want to point out is how important it is to stop and think about investing in remodeling how your business actually works today. I'm sure many of you have seen legacy systems that were built 20 years ago. Business rules are still 20 years old. Business can't get anything done in the modern digital world because those legacy systems never imagined those things. So I want to just point out that this is hard, and anybody who's embarking on this needs to really think about not only the technology approach, how do I create some decoupling along the way, create a facade layer, remodel a business capability the way we'd like it to work, collaborating with the teams that will consume it, and then go ahead and hide a lot of that system's complexity in smaller buckets of complexity, and then evolve that over time. That's a very important practice. And we heard a lot from, from Jamak today about sort of monolith migration practices. A lot of that is very relevant when you have 600 monoliths. You have to also think about that at the architecture level. But the other thing that you really need to think about is organizational support. How are you going to do this at scale across multiple teams. So it's very, we find it's very, very important to get buy-in from the organizational leaders and also think a lot about architectural governance. I don't know about the folks in this room, but I've definitely run into plenty of clients today that have swung from the days of the heavy ARB that you know, Graham was talking about earlier, swung all the way to no governance. Teams should be autonomous. They're cross-functional, right? They can do anything they want. Well, governance doesn't have to be a dirty word. Governance is about establishing good principles, teaching, supporting, and in the end, verifying. Verifying that our teaching and supporting is working. So I'd like to put out that I think governance is very, very important to be successful here, but done that way, I think we can really see that as a, as a way to educate our people and, and make sure we're going in the right direction. So the point is that we need to plan ahead. And we need to plan ahead because we also need to drive new team behaviors. So we wanna talk just about a couple of things we've seen very important for success making sure that teams really focus on their consumers' key results. So this, I'm not the expert of the ERP, and therefore I tell the world how the ERP should work. And that happens all the time, because the ERP is the master of the destiny of everybody in the enterprise, right? No, we need to make sure that we educate teams, that we drive a culture where teams are looking to their consumers and saying, what are you trying to achieve? And I'm a platform, so I must have multiple consumers, so I need to talk to all those consumers. Product management is essential. Technical product management, we find, is one of the most important things to drive when we're driving platform architecture because we need to know our customers, we need to know what makes success, and then be building things that make success for them. Sounds just like what our teams do when they build for our customers out, you know, on the, when we touch our customers out in the internet. We want to make sure that we do the same thing when we're building even for internal customers. The other thing that we talk about a lot is kind of owning the minimum. Creating a culture in the teams that says, I don't want to build all the things. Sure, teams like to build some of their own infrastructure, they like to build some of their own extra capability, but realistically, if you have pressure to ship, why do you want to own more things that you have to operate, manage? You really want to make sure that teams get in the habit of saying, how do I stay laser focused on those key results for my customers, and what can I buy? What can I bring in? What can I get the platform to give me to make my code base simpler, easier to maintain, and easier to understand? So that could be internal work that you do, like a lot of the work we heard at Sonic about the infrastructure team, or it could be going outside looking at tools like Aluma for data pipeline management, or Qball for Spark e cluster management, Optimizely, or D Launch Darkly. There's so many great tools out there that really can bring up additional capability for a team so they don't have to own it. And now we want to move on and talk a little about some organizational behaviors as well that are important. How many people saw, I thought we'd get down to those kind of the way teams interact portion of this discussion, right? How many times we've all seen, right, the way that teams communicate is, is very often through those backdoor discussions. I'll go talk to somebody, I'll interrupt somebody's context. We talk a lot about teams staying on mission. Also think about that whole interruption that keeps happening when teams have other teams constantly knocking on the door or running around behind. Or even to accelerate this to an even higher level, well now we've got a ticketing system. Okay, we've got tickets, you can just order, we can put in a ticket literally had a conversation with a client today. Your team put in a ticket to get this system quota, to get this system project set up in OpenShift. Fantastic. 
that's done. But we didn't get the quota that we needed. Why? Because even though we put the notes in the ticket as to what the quota was, there's a process for opening a second ticket for the quota. And at the bottom of the email from our client's team was, well, what will be great, though, is we'll document in the wiki that you need two tickets. Because once it's documented, you'll know. That'll make it better, right? Because once we have the documentation, we won't screw up the process that we're supposed to follow with the inter-team communication. So I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to say, what happens if we'd had a self-service API? What happens if there was a way for us to just submit a request, right? onto a, a, an OpenShift cluster for, to start a new project and ask for a quota. And if there literally was no room left, it would just say, I'm sorry, there isn't. And maybe an even better API would say, but this is how much is left, right? So thinking about how we automate these processes, how we make these things easier for our customers, because we care that our customers can ship. That's an important message. So this is an important one for me, right? As a general principle, think about shipping an API, don't think about shipping a person. If you've got to take a person from your team and put them on somebody else's team, you're doing that to eliminate some conversation or eliminate some friction. Think about whether you could do that through automation and think about whether you could do that with an API instead of with a person. Value technical product management, this is what Ryan was bringing up before. So if we have teams that are supposed to be heads down, we have teams that are supposed to stay on mission, and we're trying to say that you know, teams should only communicate technically across APIs and things like this, that's not always true. Right? Teams need to communicate with each other. They need to communicate with the business and understand what the business needs, make sure they're working for their customers. They also need to understand how their changes affect the ecosystem. So while I can deploy independently, the fact that I am going to have a schema change or a data change or a breaking API change needs to be sometimes communicated. Who's going to do that communication? In a world where we have all these technical nodes and developers on mission, product managers are that important very, very important network node between teams that allows them to communicate. You escalate that up to that person, you keep the other seven to eight to 15 developers heads down delivering value. It's a really important way, to, again, to hit those metrics for success. So some key takeaways. Build those poly-skilled teams only as you find them necessary. Don't default to cross-functionality. Think about whether you can do better on it. Even if you're cross-functional now, think about ways that you can develop APIs, that you can develop automations that help you remove that from the system over time. Again, encapsulation and self-service create scale. Think about those proper boundaries. Think about building teams the same way that you would build a bounded context if you were designing an API. Invest in long-lived capability teams. You heard this from Martin and Jamak. You've heard it multiple times today. Um, product thinking versus project thinking. These platform capabilities you're talking about building, they need to live for a long time. Whether you're building an infrastructure platform or an infrastructure paths for all the other developers, that ha that's going to evolve over time. Nothing ever happens today. But its need in the, or in the organization doesn't go away. And if the need doesn't go away, then somebody's still managing that over the long haul. And last, again, leverage project manager, product managers. Leverage that key skill within your, your company and build and invest in that key skill of technical product management from your infrastructure on up. This is also often a radical message that we give to people that there should be a product manager on the infra teams. But they've got many, 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 many customers, right? So why isn't there somebody there? So focus that from the beginning, from the top to the bottom. And that's it. You missed one. Did I miss one? Click one more time. There oh, we go. There it is. Always focus on your customers' key results. Yes, this is the heart of product management. Perfect. Thank you for giving me a chance to See? speak again. That's otherwise, okay. otherwise I wouldn't have had one well, more. Well, you shot. know, I mean, that's the one everybody forgets. So why wouldn't I forget? Thanks. Go. All right. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it.